Good morning. Let me try that again. Good morning. I know why there's a delayed response because some of you just watched that video and you're not even sure if it was in English, right? Because you did not understand a single thing that she said in the video. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna help you out. I'm gonna break it down for you a little bit. First of all, um, students have their phones in class now. That's a thing. I know like those of us that are like my age and older, that's unheard of, right? But secondly, TikTok. TikTok is a social media platform. You can watch videos, share them uh, to other people. And the government's trying to shut it down right now. So if you don't have it yet, you're gonna wanna grab that quick. And then uh, left me on red. I mean, this is super rude. You have to understand when you send a message to someone, your phone will tell you that they opened and read that message. And then if they leave you on red, that means they don't respond, okay? So uh, super rude, don't ever let that happen. Just don't, if you're going to bed, just don't read the message until the next day, then it's better. So I hope that helps you guys. I hope that now that you understand what the video was about, that's Lacey, she's one of our high school students and she did a great job with that video. But we're having a little bit of fun with these bumper videos because we're in the middle of a series called It's Not Fair. And the idea here is that when it comes to our relationship with God, it's so easy to make ourselves the center and leave other people out. Because we automatically think that, that we deserve something or we should be rewarded for the, the, things, the way that we act or the things that we do. And, and this mindset, unfortunately, it keeps us from loving others well and it actually it continues to create division amongst different groups of people. Letting go of what we deserve, letting go of fair, actually frees us to listen, to love better, and to have compassion on each other. So uh, today, I wanna give you a little look into the Kendall Hummus family of origin. So uh, when I was growing up, my mom, we, we didn't have much pop in my house. And I grew up in Colorado, so pop is, is, is the thing, not soda. Uh, we didn't have much pop in our house, but my mom used to get us a two liter every single week. One two liter to share among six people. And the way that looked was on Sunday afternoon, maybe for the Bronco game, maybe for a movie we were watching, we would open that thing up and my mom would pour four of the most even glasses she could possibly pour. And she would bring them to us and we would drink them as fast as we could so that we could get back to the kitchen and begin the war over the last little bit of soda that was left in the two liter. Now, the oldest two, my brother and I, uh, we were usually the ones that got there first. I was bigger, so I would refill my cup, leave the rest, and head back out. And whether it was a brownie, whether it was a piece of cake, whether it was a piece of pizza, uh, there was always times in my family where we were fighting over the last little bit. And what would usually happen is I would cut, take the bigger piece, and then head out because no matter how you cut it, it's never fair. It's never even. And someone would always be yelling, he got the bigger piece, he got the bigger glass. And, and my mom was genius, right? She, she created a rule in our family. We still use this rule in my family. Whoever cuts or whoever pours, they choose last. Right, Because that way, you're going to do your best to cut it as evenly as possible, to pour it as evenly as possible so that if someone else takes what they think is the bigger piece, hopefully it's very similar in size to the one that you get. Now, you might be thinking, Kendall, what does this have to do with being fair and what we're talking about today? Well, I want to tell you this story to reinforce my point that it's never fair when you compare yourself to others. Shannon and Kelsey uh, asked you a question for me in the pre-service show. If you were online or you were in the room while that happened, you heard this question, but if not, I wanna share it with you. The question was, what are you better at than anyone else in your family? What are you better at than anyone else in your family? And there were some responses. Naomi said, making birthday cakes, except my mom, her cakes are epic. Okay, that's, that's cool. Liz says, um, I'm with Shannon, the dishwasher is my job. No one else does it right. 
I wish that was the case in my house. Everyone has to load the dishwasher at some point. Deb says everything, LOL, just kidding. Well, maybe, maybe not humility, but other than that, Deb, I, I love that. And Greer says Minecraft, from what I heard, that is definitely true. But I ask you this question because I want us to start thinking about the ways that we compare ourselves to other people. And specifically, I think it's easy to do within our families. Um, I was a better baseball player than my brothers growing up. Um, I knew more about cars and motorcycles and how to fix them than anyone else in my family, and that wasn't knowing very much. But at the same time, they were all taller than me. They were all smarter than me. They were all better drivers than me. And just like growing up where we could never slice it perfectly evenly, we're all not the same. We're all different. So it's never fair when you compare yourself to others because that's how it is. We're different, yet we keep doing it, right? We constantly think like, how does that person have more talent than me? Or, or how does that person have more money than me? Or, or man, I'm glad that I have more friends than they do. Or I'm, I'm glad my kids are better behaved than their kids. Because no matter how you look at it, in life, there are people with advantages and there are people with disadvantages. And, and I know that's not a popular opinion these days, but it's true. It's true, and and if we're not willing to admit that, it makes it very difficult to have this conversation. And, and And I realize that sometimes those advantages and those disadvantages, sometimes they're because of people's actions, right? That the decisions that they make, how hard they work or or how hard they don't work, sometimes it, it just seems like dumb luck. But at other times, these advantages or disadvantages, they have to do with where you were born or they have to do with the color of your skin or or the socioeconomic background that you grew up in or that your family was, that you were born into or any number of circumstances that are really beyond your control. And, And unfortunately, if we continue to fall into the trap of comparison, it's going to make us miserable. It will steal our joy. We will always be disappointed that someone else has it better than us or it will make us entitled and we will feel like we're better than someone else or that we deserve more than someone else. And this will divide us. Comparison makes us choose sides. It turns us into terrible friends. It makes us into people that are no fun to be around. It it makes us unhappy. So knowing that it's never gonna be fair when we compare ourselves to others, How do then we, as followers of Jesus, how do we go from jealousy and entitlement or or resentment that continue to create division between different groups? How do we go from that and start showing love to each other, bring compassion, maybe even joy into our lives? So to start, I wanna look at a story that Jesus tells his friends in Matthew chapter 20. Now, Last week, Phil talked about the story uh, of the rich young ruler, and that's in Matthew 19. It's the very end of the chapter. And the part that I'm gonna read is the very beginning of Matthew 20. And, And the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and he says, he basically says, hey, have I been obedient enough? Have I obeyed enough commandments to get into heaven? And Jesus says, well, that's really not what it's about. Go sell everything you have, and then you can have eternal life. And that is a extreme oversimplification of the passage. So you need to go back, watch the message from last week if you missed it. But at the very end of chapter 19, after that story, Jesus says these words. He says, many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Uh, like, Like Jesus is saying, my economy is not the same as the world's. It's different and it's not fair. When when talking about who gets into heaven, it's not about obedience. It's not about who follows the rules because we're all sinful people when we compare ourselves to Jesus. No, it's about who is willing to sacrifice their life, every bit of themselves, who's willing to give up their riches, whatever that looks like for each of us to follow Jesus and have an amazing relationship with him. 
And so he ends and says, the, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And then it's like he just says, oh, wait, 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 hang on. But there's a whole, there's, there's more to it. There's more to it than just figuring out how to get into heaven. In fact, it's, it's never fair when you compare yourself to others. So this is what happens when you compare yourself to others. And we read this in Matthew 20, verse 1. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, a denarius would be like one day's wages. Common payment to somebody who would work for you, you would, you'd pay them a denarius, one day's wage. After that, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them, he said, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. Well, so here's the deal. It's already not fair, right? There are people working out in the vineyard who have been working all day, and they're going to get paid more than the people who, only, uh, who showed up three hours late and, and started working. And, and what we don't see in this, the passages that we didn't read is that people showed up in the sixth hour. He hired people in the ninth hour, and he hired even more people in the eleventh hour and sent them out to work in the fields. And, and, if, and if you're standing out in the vineyard and you're working you would, if you're the first guy hired, you'd think, I have an advantage here. I'm going to make more than anybody else here because I was hired first. And, and if you're the guy that was hired in the 11th hour, you're thinking, oh man, I wish I hadn't slept in today. I, I, wish, I wish I had done that differently. If I would have showed up at the beginning, I had a chance to make a full day's wages. Now I'm, I'm not going to make as much. This, ah, this doesn't seem fair. But Jesus, he flips the script. And, and it says at the end of the day, the laborers, they, they came to get paid. And in verse nine, it says, when, they, when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought, well, they would receive more, but each of them also received a, a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house. Why did they grumble at the master of the house? <laughs> because it wasn't fair. I mean, you, there's no way you can pay all of us the same, right? Like, I, I worked 11 more hours than that guy did. I, I had the advantage. I was there all day. I should be paid the most. If you're going to hire somebody else, you pay me more. Or if nothing else, you for sure pay them less. They worked less. But look what the master of the house says. He replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. So here's a question for you. I'd love for you to answer in social media. Who in your life is it easiest for you to be generous toward? Who in your life is it easiest to be generous toward? For, for me, I, I like to consider myself a generous person. I like to be generous with people uh, who are generous to me. I, I like to be generous uh, to my kids most of the time. I, I like to be generous when people aren't expecting it. I, one of my favorite things is to give gifts to someone when they're not expecting it or something that's unexpected, to, to pay for their lunch when we're going to lunch and they weren't expecting me to pay. Have you ever noticed there are just people in life who are like extra generous? I hope you have those people in your life. I hope you have those people that are willing to drive you to the airport at four o'clock in the morning. Those people that are willing to give you their car when your car's broke down in, in the shop for a few days. Those people that offer you their cabin in the mountains so that you can take your family away for a weekend. All of those things, I didn't have to make those up. Those have happened to me because of generous people. And, and I, think, I think people are generous to me because they like me, right? Friends, people that are easy. They, they, they maybe are they're generous to me because they think I'm a nice person. They know that I don't have my own cabin in the mountains, so they, they want to be kind to me. It's easy. It's easy to be generous with people that you like. It's easy to be generous with people that you know, with people that deserve it, right? I want us to look at this story from two different perspectives today. The first perspective is from that of the landowner. I would love 
to meet this guy. I'd love to sit down and have lunch with him. He sounds like a kind of an interesting dude. He's obviously kind of big in his town. He's, he's walking around. He's hiring people, like numerous people, to go out and work in his vineyard. He's probably got a lot of money. Uh, and yet it, it would be interesting to see because he's a generous guy. He wants to give people the opportunity to work and, and he's being generous, but he's beyond that. He's what I would say, he is giving people undeserved generosity. And, and undeserved generosity looks like this. Let me read verse eight again. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. I mean, even as I read it a second time, it's not fair, right? <laughs> this does not fair. Undeserved generosity is when someone works all day long and you pay them a day's wages. And then someone else works for one hour and you pay them the same day's wages. It's not deserved. He, he doesn't deserve that extra money. The landowner, he didn't have to do this. The landowner doesn't have to pay the guys at the end as much as he pays the guys at the beginning. He could have paid more to the guys at the beginning. He could have paid less to the guys at the end. Why would he do this? And honestly, in this case, we don't know. But Jesus tells the story this way. And we just know that he is generous. But, but why would anyone give undeserved generosity? Why should we be generous to someone that doesn't deserve it? Why should we be generous or extend grace to someone that has ruined their life through addiction and bad choices? Why should we extend grace to someone that doesn't get a job? Why should we give grace to someone who is fresh out of prison, trying to provide for their family? Why should we? Because Jesus did it for us. Undeserved generosity starts with grace. Jesus died on the cross forgave us of our sins so that we could be in right relationship with him and we didn't deserve it. We needed it, but we didn't deserve it. And he did it anyway. The people around us who need generosity, they might not deserve it, but Jesus would give them grace. So shouldn't we give them grace? Undeserved generosity, it starts with grace the kind of grace that has been shown to us by Jesus. Now, a minute ago, I asked you, uh, who in your life is it easiest to be generous towards? Azumi said, strangers and friends. You're just generous to everyone, that's great. Melinda said, my husband. Jan and Melissa said, friends and family. And Allie said, my friends. Yeah, sometimes it's easier to give and be generous to the people who we know. Other people in different services have said sometimes it's easier with strangers if you have strained relationships with those people who are closest to you. What's not fair, what's not fair is that we're asked to be generous like the landowner to people around us, people we don't think deserve generosity. And if you're comparing yourself to the people around you, it's never going to be fair. But if you compare yourself to Jesus, you'll see that his grace towards you and you'll see that he calls us to be generous to the people around us in the same way without exceptions. So does everyone around you receive grace from you? That's a hard question. The hard answer is they should. Undeserved generosity is a tough one. Here's the good news. It only gets tougher. Let's look at another perspective on this story. Let's look at the group of laborers that were hired first thing in the morning. And let me ask you a question that I'd like for you to answer in the chat again. The question is, when were you upset because someone got something that you wanted? When were you upset that someone got something that you wanted? Now, uh, 
it's kind of a joke in my family, but it's really not a joke. Um, my brother's birthday is on March 7th, and my birthday is on March 10th. And from the time I was probably five years old until maybe 12, 25, 35, I don't know, somewhere in there, I, I used to cry and throw a fit every single time my brother opened presents on his birthday. I wasn't excited for him at all. I was upset and mad that I didn't get to open my presents for another three days, right? There is a picture uh, at my parents' house somewhere, I couldn't find it this week, where my brother is holding up a brand new set of underoos. Now, if you're my age or around my age, you understand what underoos are. This was uh, underwear that was a t-shirt and briefs branded with a superhero. It was almost like a miniature costume. We always wanted to wear them for Halloween, highly inappropriate, you know, but, but I wanted some underoos and here's my brother holding his Green Lantern underoos in the picture and I am over his left shoulder bawling my eyes out. Probably 10 years old. I couldn't even celebrate my brother's birthday because I was so upset about the fact that he got presents and I didn't. And not that I didn't, I wouldn't for three more days. My underoos were wrapped up in my parents' closet somewhere. I was comparing myself to him. I was wanting what he had when I didn't have it. It's not fair that he gets presents on his birthday and that I have to wait three days before mine. And do you realize that it was impossible for me in that circumstance with that attitude to be part of what I call an authentic celebration. Authentic celebration is when you are truly happy for someone, whether that's because of something they received, like a raise or a new house, a new car, or, or maybe something that they did. They, they went on a big vacation. They won the lottery. They made the varsity team. They hit the home run. They had another child. I found that when we're caught up in the trap of comparing ourselves to others, what they have, how much money they make, how great their family is, what their house is like, what their car is like, what their life looks like. When we are caught up in that, we are incapable of authentic celebration or really even any celebration of the good that's happening to the people around us. We act like these laborers who were hired early in verse 11. And on receiving it, their denarius, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. A lot of times we're just like them. We get mad. We get upset when it's not fair. They, these guys, they're literally throwing a hissy fit here in front of their bosses. They're telling him how it's just not fair. They'd be paid to someone the same amount as someone who worked one hour. They have no ability to celebrate and be happy with the guy who, who just worked one hour and got paid a full day's wage. This might be one of their friends. It might be one of their neighbors from the same town and they can't celebrate for him and the good fortune that he has because they're so upset with the way that they were mistreated. In Romans, uh, there's a book in the New Testament. Paul writes Romans and he's writing these words. He says, rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. These, these were big, big words for Paul to say because he, all, there were lots of miserable things going on in his life. I mean, he had, been, he had been beaten and flogged numerous times. He had been shipwrecked three times, almost drowned. He spent lots of sleepless nights in jail. He didn't have a permanent house of his own. He'd been bitten by poisonous snakes. He had no problem mourning with those who mourn. Like he had all the disadvantages. He understood, he got it. But at the same time, he says, rejoice with those who rejoice. See, God calls us to rejoice with people when they have something to celebrate. Even this week, as I was working on this message, knowing what I was gonna be talking about, there, there were times when I was, had negative feelings towards someone because of their success or because of something that was going on in their life where I felt like I wish that was happening to me or I wish I thought I was deserving of something like that. But can I just tell you, 
Our sinful nature, our human nature, it, 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 it prevents us from authentic celebration because envy and greed and bitter take over. But can I just tell you that when you, when you do this, when you're able to celebrate someone in the middle of their successes, it is so fun. It's so fun for them. It's so fun for you. House por- housewarming parties are, are one of my favorite things. When someone moves into a big, huge, brand new, unbelievable house, it is easy to be jealous. It is easy to be bitter. But if you embrace it, if you enjoy it, if you give them, if you let them give you a tour, you let them show you around, you share their excitement, you are excited for them and this new house that they have, they might actually invite you back over again. And how cool is it that you get to hang out in someone's house that is way better than yours, right? A minute ago, I asked you when you were upset, when you were upset when someone got something that you wanted, Eileen said, someone got recognition at work that I thought I also deserved. Mm. Melinda said, my sister got a brand new Nissan SUV for her 16th birthday when I got a bright yellow 1972 VW Beetle. It's still a sore subject. I can tell. I can tell, (laughs) Melinda. Melissa said, my brother purposely buying himself a PSP when we were younger because he knew I wanted one and we had just gotten into an argument. (laughs) Ha ha ha, look what I got, yeah right. And then Caleb says, when my sister got more of the cookie. Yeah, exactly, I hear you Caleb. Well, my little brother hears you more than I do, but. (laughs) See, it's not easy. But I think if we really wanna get out of the comparison trap, if we really want to get past seeing seeing everything that other people have is not fair, we need to learn to authentically celebrate people. If we can practice this, if we can learn how to do this, I think we will have less it's not fair conversations and we will have so much more joy and peace inside of ourselves. In about 30 days, there's gonna be this little thing called the election, right? About half of the population in this country is going to be happy and celebrating. I would say that day, but I don't think we're going to know for a few, day, a few weeks. And half of the population is going to be angry and upset and scared and any other kind of emotion that you can think of. But in the days leading up to that, in the days following that, would you do me a favor? I want you to remember what we talked about today. There is a way... There is a way to authentically celebrate and extend grace at the same time that we could all strive for. Not just during elections, but any time. Because some of us, we like to be the rub it in your face jerk, right? To the point where no one wants to talk to us anymore, wants to be our friend anymore. Let's not be that in the middle of this. I want you to think about that. Do you celebrate people well? If not, how could we learn to be better at it? We might need to stop comparing ourselves to other people because it's never fair when you compare yourself to others. We're all different. We all have advantages and different and disadvantages. So where do we start? I think we start with this question. Who do you need to stop comparing yourself to? If comparing ourselves to the people around us is such a problem, such a big part of the problem, who do you need to stop comparing yourself to? Maybe you just need to unfollow them on social media because every time you look at their page, it makes you feel bad about yourself or it makes you feel like you're better than them. It either leads you to envy and jealousy or it leads you to entitlement. And simply not comparing ourselves to that person could go a long, long way. I I love the next words the landowner says in chapter 15. He says, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? I mean, I love it. I, I love this landowner. He gets it. 
He's giving undeserved generosity. He is involved in authentic celebration. This is, when I read the Bible, this is how I think of things. I think this landowner, right? He is, he goes and sends these guys out into his vineyard and he's like, we got a lot of work today, guys. Go out there, get it done. I'll pay you each a denarius. Three hours later, he's in the market and he's like, they're not getting it done out there. You three, you guys head on out there, get, get, go, go. Six, six hours later, nine hours later. I think this is what happens. In the 11th hour, he's like, these guys are only gonna be there for one hour. But man, they still need help. Guys, go out into the vineyard. And then he's like, oh, I got an idea. What if I pay them the same as the first guys? And I'm sure other people around him are like, you can't do that. And he's like, no, I can do whatever I want. I'm gonna do this because here's the thing. These guys walk up. The guy that's worked one hour walks up and he goes, here's an denarius. The guy's like, oh. No way, I only worked one hour. He gave me a full day's wages. How fun is that? How fun is that for the landowner? And the very next words that Jesus says after that sentence are the last shall be first and the first shall be last. In my economy, Jesus says, it is not the same. It's not fair because it can never be fair in comparison to me. So, so how do we make sure that all people are treated fairly? We're so busy comparing ourselves to other people, trying to see if they have it better than us or if we have it better to them. That shouldn't be the goal. The goal should be to make sure that everyone is treated fairly. And it's going to start with us giving generously to people that don't deserve it giving lots of grace to people that don't deserve it. And then, and then you know what we have to do? We have to, we have to go and practice. And we need to work hard because this does not happen naturally. We need to go and work hard to authentically celebrate when people succeed, when good things happen to them or for them, the people around us. When we do these things, we will start to see more compassion around us than division between us. I got four questions that I wanna end with. Four questions that I would love for you to ask, maybe today, maybe sometime this week, that I think will move us to generosity and celebration of other people around us if we're willing to ask these four questions. First question, in our conversations, do I have a posture of humility? Not like, oh, I'm a humble person, but, but do you think you're better than them? Do you think you're smarter than them? Do you think you live in a better neighborhood than them? Or can you really come at it in a posture of humility? Second question, have I asked questions to understand? Do I understand where they're coming from? Do I understand why they might have disadvantages? Why they might have advantages? Have I asked those questions? And then thirdly, do I get quiet and truly listen? Have you ever had someone truly listen to you? It's a different experience because today we don't listen very well. We, we listen thinking of what we're gonna ask next. We listen thinking about how we're going to respond to what they're telling us. But do we stop, get quiet and truly listen to someone? And then four, can I just accept what is? Can I be content knowing that there's gonna be some people who have it better than me, knowing that there's gonna be some people that have it worse than me? Can I, can I be content where I am? Or, or like the song we're gonna sing in just a minute, or am I available? Am I available to make a difference? to do things different, to start to bring Jesus' economy back into the norm where the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Because after we've asked ourselves those four questions, choose undeserved generosity and authentic celebration because it will bring you so much more joy than looking for fairness in the people around us. We're gonna sing a new song, a new song that, that says, I am available. 
And I hope that is our prayer to God today. I'm available to live a new way, one that puts comparison aside and focuses on generosity and celebration. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for the challenge of this story that you told thousands of years ago, how much it challenges us today. Lord, thank you for giving us undeserved generosity, undeserved grace. And Lord, may we do that to the other people around us. May we celebrate them well, even when we feel like it should have been us. Even when we feel like we deserve it and we didn't get it. God, this is difficult. We're gonna need your help. So Lord, I pray for your help in this coming week, in this coming month, that you would help us to extend generosity and grace and to celebrate people well. We love you. We need you. We pray these things in your name. Amen.